Hello everyone, welcome once again. Uh, my guest today is Professor Talia Gillis from Columbia Law School. She's a lawyer and economist and expert on AI in consumer finance. Hi Talia, it's great you are here. Hi, thank you, thank you for having me. Tell me uh, about recent projects on AI you, you conduct in Columbia Law School. Yeah, so I've been working on a number of topics um, recently. Maybe I'll highlight just kind of two of the topics. Um, one thing I've become particularly interested in is in how we should think about the use of algorithms in a context, not that an algorithm or an algorithmic prediction is replacing a human decision making. That's kind of the automation paradigm, but rather in a situation where um, an algorithm is being used as a decision aid for a human decision maker. And that's a particularly um, important way to, to think about the use of algorithms, particularly as um, we have this push and regulation of AI to have a human in the loop. So this idea that actually we shouldn't be in a world of automation, um, algorithms should always be used to some extent. And one of the reasons this is so interesting is that a lot of the assumptions that maybe we have about what makes an algorithm fair changes in a world in which there's a human decision maker. So for example, if I have an algorithm that predicts credit worthiness um, and it's given to a human decision maker, um, if I say to the human decision maker, this information is included or excluded in the algorithm that might impact the ultimate decision because if the human decision maker themselves has some kind of bias against a certain group, then excluding that information from the algorithm and then allowing the human to kind of combine their bias prior in the decision making may mean that we result, we, we have more biased decision making. So I'm really interested in thinking of how we should build regulatory structures that don't just audit the algorithm in isolation, but the whole decision making process. Um, another topic that I've been really interested um, lately is thinking about different dimensions of um, consumer credit pricing beyond uh, credit worthiness. So a lot of us, when we think about um, consumer credit, we think about risk based pricing, which is based on a prediction of credit worthiness of default. But we know that there are other ways in which uh, credit pricing is, uh, is personalized and um, is different for different consumers. It could be based on um, consumers willingness to pay for a loan. It could be based on things like uh, prepayment risk, the risk that someone will prepay their, their loan early. Um, so I'm very interested in thinking about kind of the interaction between those other elements of pricing and using AI for those other elements and their impact on um, consumers. You wrote a great paper, Input Fallacy. I read it, of course, and you write there that uh, AI, uh, when using biased inputs, may impact uh, discrimination. So how can we avoid it? Yeah, I, I think that it's actually a pretty complicated question. You know, sometimes we think about bias in, bias out. If you only improve algorithmic inputs, make them more accurate, then we get better results. But I think actually it's a lot more complicated than that. I think on the one hand, when we think of kind of what happens when we move away from a model that of credit pricing that relies more heavily on human discretion, perhaps very few variables to a world in which Perhaps we have more automation, reliance on, on advanced statistical technologies like machine learning and the use of big data. On the one hand, I think there are a lot of benefits to think about that move. In the US, credit worthiness assessments are very dominated by credit scores. And that essentially means that large sectors of the population who have very thin credit files or no credit files have no access to mainstream credit markets. And so there's the potential when we use alternative data to open that up. I think we have a lot of issues around what I call kind of bias measurements of variables. When we have less data, then we're estimating different things like income and wealth in a very noisy way that may be biased against certain groups. So that's perhaps the benefits, but obviously the difficulties are the fact that to a large extent, a lot of the information we use in credit worthiness itself is a process of some kind of historical injustice. It's a process of, of the human decisions made by credit officers in the past. And mm -hmm. um, all that may kind of impact what kind of information we're using to then predict going forward people's credit worthiness. And so there's a real importance here in really being sensitive to the fact that there are these, these benefits, but also these costs when we think about these new technologies. But should AI improve this level of uh, unfairness? How can we benefit from using AI in this process? So I think the most important thing is to develop appropriate kind of empirical tests and auditing methods that really get to the questions that we care about from a policy perspective. 
I think the approach should move away from trying in the abstract to determine what data is good data or what data is bad data and what inputs are biased or not and take a much more empirical approach which is to look at the outcomes, right? If we, if we want to use different types of data, if we want to use new technologies, let's understand the concrete welfare impacts that it has on different groups um, and perhaps the disparities between different groups. Okay, thank you for a great discussion. And you guys see you uh, same hour next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.